With 5 Billboard chart topping albums, 3 mixtapes and more top 10 Billboard singles than any other artist. From a commercial standpoint, Drake just had the most ridiculous decade of any artist ever. And he's also gone through more transformations than any musician I can think of. Early in his career, Drake was the poster boy of honesty. He built a career on writing emotional, introspective music, alongside his producer and engineer, 40, who helped him carve a sound that was unique and transformative. From 2010 to 2013, there were countless artists trying to sound like Drake, but now it seems like the tables have turned and Drake is biting whatever style is hot to stay on top. It seems like somewhere along the way, he became more interested in maintaining his relevancy than being authentic. And in attempting to please everyone, he diluted himself as a person and lost his own identity. People change, I mean, I change every day. I'm not knocking that. I just can't get down with Drake's recent image because I feel like he's trying to be something he's not. But maybe along the way, he got so immersed in this caricature of himself that he started believing it. Perhaps Aubrey Graham's best acting days weren't as Wheelchair Jimmy on Degrassi, but rather playing a hip-hop superstar named Drake, a man who's capable of jumping to the top of the charts with any release. <laughs> Who else really trying to mess with Hollywood code? I'm treating Birmingham like my Hollywood shows. I'm trying to tell you something that you probably should know. It's that slumdog millionaire Bollywood flow. And Aubrey Drake Graham was born on October 24, 1986 in Toronto, Canada. His father, Dennis Graham, was a drummer for rock and roll star Jerry Lee Lewis. Drake said his mother, Sandy, also comes from a very musical family, and his grandma used to babysit for Aretha Franklin. Drake comes from an eclectic background. His father is an African-American Catholic, and his mother is a white Canadian Jew. His parents divorced when he was five years old, and he was raised by his mother in Forest Hill, an affluent and predominantly Jewish neighborhood in Toronto. Toronto. In interviews, he's taken issue with people saying he had an easy life. I only moved to Forest Hill because my mother is an incredible woman who was willing to live beyond, far beyond her means for the sake of her family. We rented a, someone's basement and the first floor. I didn't have some mansion. I wasn't, you know, I, I grew up with a mother that was deep in debt because she wanted the best for her family. In this nicer neighborhood, Drake found being biracial was more of an issue than when he lived in the poorer section of a Weston Road. I just always felt like an outsider. I, I went, when I was in Forest Hill, you know, it was an all Jew Jewish school, like, and just being biracial, but still being Jewish. So I was like kind of connected to the kids, but like sort of distant. It was Drake's dad that really spurred his interest in music. Dennis would bring five to six year old Drake to gigs at various bars around Toronto and get him to go on stage and sing at times. After his divorce, Dennis moved to Memphis. So Drake spent part of his childhood in Tennessee, where he was influenced by the Southern rap culture. In Memphis, Dennis started selling drugs and was eventually caught and put in jail. While in prison, he'd reserved time for Drake to speak to a fellow inmate who also rapped. My dad used to share uh, his phone time with this guy and this guy used to rap. So he used to read me his raps over the phone. And I told him, you know, I, I rap too. So we used to kind of, I used to be like, it got to the point where I'd be like, yeah, dad, all right, cool. Where, where's, where, you know, where's he at? Uh, like, I got new raps to, I got new raps to get, uh, spit for him or whatever. So we used to kind of use the remainder of my dad's phone time and just rap, rap and rap until it cut off. Unfortunately for Drake, Dennis wasn't as involved in his upbringing as he would have liked. And this would become a major theme in his music where he'd lament on the absence of his father. It was actually one of Drake's classmates at Forest Hill who gave him his start in the entertainment industry. Drake said, quote, There was a kid in my class whose father was an agent. His dad would say, If there's anyone in the class that makes you laugh, have them audition for me. After the audition, he became my agent. In 2001, at 14 years old, Drake landed a role on the famous Canadian teenage drama called Degrassi. Drake, who was then still going by the name Aubrey Graham, was cast as Jimmy Brooks, a popular 8th grade basketball star and eventual paraplegic. He starred on the show for seven years, but worked on music on his time off. I have to utilize those days and like, you know, I'm working with a phenomenal engineer by the name of Noah. He's also a producer, goes by the name of 4040. And we get in here, you know, I get in here when I can. I get in here, if it, I start sessions at one, two in the morning and we leave at seven, six when the sun's up. You have to really budget your time. 
you know, and, and, it, and it, is, it is a challenge. I've been a mess since every girl I left went and got a new man, but I'm the new version of Fresh Prince, and the bands got bumped for real. I switch wifey every season like Uncle Phil, and then the chorus drops. So that was a little verse I wrote. A little something, a little something, something. After shooting several seasons, the producers of Degrassi decided to take the show a different direction and laid off Drake and his co-stars. It was an upsetting time for me, you know. We all kind of came in, the names on our dressing rooms were changed, you know, they were making a complete changeover. They were starting over with new younger kids. I remember telling my mom that I was going to tell my agent that I'm going to probably take a break and see where this music thing takes me. Drake released his debut mixtape Room for Improvement in 2006 and his second mixtape comeback season the following year. Jazz Prince, whose father's legendary label founder James J. Prince, was looking to make a name for himself in the music business, so his dad told him to look for the next hottest thing. At the time, MySpace had a music explorer page, and Jazz came across Drake's music, and it immediately caught his attention. He found me on MySpace, and I told him, I was like, yo, I like your music. And he was like, okay, I was like, I'm gonna make you famous. He was like, man, I know Lil Wayne, and I'm gonna play him your music one day, and I was just like, Psh. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. like, you, you never really, I, I didn't buy it at first. I told my dad, like, yo, I found somebody that has a buzz, I feel like, and it's hot. Like, let me hear it. And I played it for him, he didn't get it. Was like, what's all this singing he doing on this, on this music? Jazz also sent Drake's music to Lil Wayne. I waited like a week, I hit him every day, he heard it, he heard it, he heard it. He finally hit me back, I was like, yo, bro, he sucked, don't ever play this shit for me again. A few months later, Jazz was driving Lil Wayne to a jewelry store and saw another opportunity to put on Drake. I got him in my car. I'm about to play some Drake. <laughs> so we riding, I'm playing shit, you know, I'm jamming, you know, I'm, I'm jamming, I'm looking at him and I see him over there like, you know, bobbing his head. I'm like, okay. He was like, who is this? I was like, oh, that's that nigga Drake that you told me you didn't like. <laughs> and he was like, he's good. He's like, where he at? I'm like, he's in Toronto. I was like, man, I, I can get him here ASAP. Like, I need y'all to meet. He was like, I'm talking about the call right now. I was like, uh, hello? I was like, yo, what's up? I was like, this doesn't sound like my friend. And he's like, yo, what's up, it's Wheezy. And it was, you know, it ended up being, it ended up being Wayne. He was like, I'm starting this thing called Young Money and I'd really love for you to be a part of it. So I want to fly you out to Houston and meet you. And he did just that the day after, and, and that formed our relationship. And I was like this quiet kid in the corner of the bus, you yeah. know, while everything was going on around me. And the Carter Three was just, I think it was like maybe two or three weeks away from coming out. And uh, what a time. That night, we drove on a bus to um, Atlanta. And that night, we went to the studio. That's where we cut the first Forever, Stunt Hard, and another song you can't think of in about Two weeks later, them songs leaked, and that was that. Drake released his first commercial EP, So Far Gone, in February 2009, and it peaked at number six on the Billboard charts. His debut single, Best I Ever Had, hit number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and helped make him a household name. From here, Drake turned into a global superstar, and every commercial album he's dropped has peaked at number one on the charts. Drake's arrival in music marked a new path. He wove together singing as rapping and rapping as singing. In early 2010, hip-hop had just come out of an intense auto-tune phase, and the proven formula was that a rapper would tell the story, and then bring a singer in to provide emotion or sensuality. Drake showed the world that those parts could be delivered by the same person. Kanye West deserves a lot of credit for helping pioneer the genre of introspective rap with 808s and Heartbreak, but Drake and 40 turned that style into a sound that was their own. Drake's early lyrics are extremely personal and convey universal emotions like love and regret. To me, like making music for girls is just the waviest thing you could do. So I was never really, you know, out of all the things that people will say about me, I was never affected by the whole like, ah, oh, you know, this is soft or this is emotional or whatever. Cause I was just kind of like, I mean, I guess I just make music for like dusty guys and shit, but like that's just not really like what inspires me, you know? Drake won a Grammy for best rap album in 2011 with Take Care. And two years later, Drake released Nothing Was The Same, which is my personal favorite album by him. And just like his title, after that, nothing was the same. 
By 2014, Drake had positioned himself comfortably at the top of rap commercially and wanted to assert himself as a confident individual. I'm so sick of people saying that, uh, that I'm like, lonely and emotional and like associating me with this like longing for a woman or sad guy yeah, yeah i hate that man it bothers me so much in his recent albums it seems like his sole concern is maintaining clout so he's hopped on trend after trend without creating his own path in 2015 he released a collaborative project with future after future's epic run of releases and the following year drake released a bloated and predictable album that lacked real creative energy that felt like a room full of corporate execs were tasked with finding regional jams that Drake could repackage and turn into a commercial hit. And these songs have led some to accuse Drake of being a quote, culture vulture, though he's quick to dismiss those claims. The definition of appropriating a culture is, is not supporting that culture, doing songs with people who are deeply rooted in that culture, giving opportunity to people who are in that culture. That's not appropriating. Appropriating is taking it for your own personal gain and denying that, that it was ever inspired from this. That's the true disservice that somebody could do to the UK, to dance hall, to Afro beats. Drake has had a long history of rap beefs, but the two most notable are pivotal to the man we see today in 2020. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail on them because I think that could make for its own separate compelling video. But the first major one was with Meek Mill, who blasted Drake on Twitter for allegedly having someone else write some of his rhymes. Drake responded with a one-two punch of diss tracks, charged up and back to back, which unanimously put him as the winner of that feud. I do think that that win propelled part of Drake's new tough guy persona. He thought, oh, I beat the street rapper. I'm on top of the charts. No one can touch me. And that is until he got roped into a feud with Pusha T, who ultimately gave him the biggest L of his career when he dropped a disc called The Story of Addy Don, where he exposed Drake for having a secret baby Adonis with a former porn star. Basically, Pusha asserts that Drake is continuing the cycle of not being present as a father. Things got worse when Drake's own father went on the radio with Nick Cannon and dismissed the notion that he was an absent father. I have uh, always been with Drake. Mm. I talk to him, if not every day, every other day. Wow. Um, I said, Drake, why are you saying all of this uh, different stuff about me, man? Like, uh, uh, this is not cool. And uh, he goes, Dad. It sells records. <laughs> Many fans hoped Drake would address these topics on his fifth studio album, Scorpion, but he mainly avoided those to focus on typical Drake themes, like the burden of dating multiple beautiful women at once and the audacity of rappers to speak on his name. Scorpion is a doozy of an album with 25 songs that span 90 minutes, and it's not a very fun listen. But numbers don't lie, and Scorpion debuted at number one on the charts and broke both Spotify and Apple Music's one-day global record for album streams. With Drake's upcoming album Certified Loverboy set to drop soon, it's almost certain to be another commercial hit, but all I can do is hope for a more focused, honest, and compelling record. I'm outside in a damn Jeep, right outside. There's certainly something to be said about Aubrey Graham being able to make it out of his childhood Nickelodeon image as wheelchair Jimmy and turn into Drake, a global superstar. And him and 40 deserve a ton of credit. They've made countless bangers over the years. And I do like a lot of his songs. I just can't get down with his current image. He just comes across as fake. He's told us over many songs and albums that he's insecure. And maybe some of that comes from him hiding the fact that he's actually a nice guy that was raised really well. He's pretending he wasn't. This is the exact opposite of the advice Lil Wayne gave him out the gate. He's always just like, man, please be yourself. Please don't ever try and be me or anybody else. Don't ever go get tattoos. You don't have to do, you don't have to dress any different, you know, because, um, I, like from the day Wayne met me to now, I didn't, I haven't changed anything about myself. He met me and he really liked the kid that he met. And he was like, don't stop smiling either. Don't try and get mean or aggressive. He's like, just be you. Drake doesn't do interviews anymore. And the recent one he did actually inspired this video. It was a two hour and 20 minute rap radar interview that he produced himself. 
It's one of the most scripted interviews I've ever seen, yet it screams desperation. And perhaps that's because Drake touches on vulnerable topics, but answers them with polished practice answers. And in that way, it kind of feels like a politician. At the DNC, Biden was straight reading off the teleprompter, while at the RNC, Trump is leaning on the pulpit and winging it. I don't even like Trump, but he's actually speaking his mind, and that makes him more likable. Biden very well may be a better guy behind closed doors, but we don't even know him. And for many people, the evil you know is better than the evil you don't. The Rap Radar interview gave me an impression that I don't trust Drake. I like a lot of his music, but I don't trust him. If Tyler says something, I go, yes, this is exactly how he feels. With Drake, he just says the right thing, and maybe that's why we don't trust him. Um, some of like my, my blackest friends can be just as, as cruel on the other end, mm. you know, by, by making you feel excluded. Sometimes I don't feel celebrated when I know maybe somebody else would be celebrated for those accomplishments, you know? Yeah. I don't feel like people say, when Drake is the artist of the decade, I don't think anybody says, wow, a black artist is the artist of the decade. I don't think anybody says that, really. I never heard anybody say that in the last few weeks. Drake has always felt like an outsider, and I feel for him for that reason. That was part of his allure early on and what resonated with me, because I've always been someone that never quite fit into a single group. When I think back on my high school experience, I remember sophomore year looking around the lunchroom and not knowing which table to sit at. I had a couple friends at multiple tables, but no one was vying for me to sit with them, so I picked one and sat at the end of the table with honestly no one wanting to talk to me. I wasn't integral, I wasn't actually a part of the group, and I jumped between three different tables that year. But as I got older and more confident, more myself, I found my people and that wasn't an issue my last two years of high school. Drake is an artist that you put on at a pregame that will pass every time and you won't get judged. It's the least vulnerable. I think it'd be very difficult for me to go on a date and have a conversation with someone about being a Drake fan. It's like wearing Nike. It's the most inoffensive thing you could wear. No one would shit on you for it, but it doesn't say much about you as a person. Yeah, Drake is the highest selling artist of all time in the US. But when all is said and done, I don't think that says much about the art. The Avengers is the highest grossing film ever, but is it the best movie of all time? It's scary to put yourself out there. Everyone can relate to where Drake's coming from, but we can also relate to why it's the wrong direction. He has a massive fan base and has the opportunity to elevate their taste levels. If, you, if you're able to like wrap your head around it and be like, okay, cool, I get it. It is what it is, good song. It, yeah. that's, not, that's not what like great music is. Great music takes a little, takes a little work on your part. You know, it takes you almost maybe elevating your listening level and becoming, you know, a, a bit more of a sophisticated listener because of a song or because of an album. So I want to give a big shout out to Audible for sponsoring this video. Audible is great because I'm a big fan of reading, but I often can't find time to just sit down, pull out a book and make it happen. But Audible has changed that for me. And if you click the link in my bio at audible.com slash jigzeman, or if you text jigzeman to 500-500, they will give you a free audiobook along with access to a bunch of podcasts, guided wellness programs, and comedy. And this is actually cool because many of these audiobooks normally go for a ton of money. Right now I'm listening to Dune by Frank Herbert because the movie adaptation is coming out at the end of the year with my boy Timothy Chalamet and my girl Zendaya. And basically I want to be the guy that goes, the book is better. But really it's been nice to be able to listen to a book while I shoot hoops, cook, or go on a walk. And I like that I can ramp up the audio speed. So again, click the link in my bio if you want to get one free audiobook credit, along with 30 days of access to the Audio Plus catalog. And they'll give you guys an email reminder before your trial ends. A lot of you know this, but I just quit my day job. So if you like these videos, you want to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon at patreon.com slash jakezeman. I have some exclusive content on there, like a monthly newsletter that I am actually sending out tomorrow with some writings and some of my favorite recent movies, videos, and albums. And I just uploaded a backyard chat with one of my best friends and a contributor to this channel. And we ramble about money, existentialism, and possibly moving out of the US. 
I also give stickers and hats to my patrons depending on the tier. If you just directly want to get some stickers, hats, and t-shirts, you can do so at jakezeman.com, and I just got some sweet new colorways in. You can follow me on Instagram at jakezeman. I post video previews and music on there. And lastly, check out my Spotify. I curate a ton of playlists, including a pregame bangers playlist with some epic hip hop jams, a vintage rap playlist with a bunch of 90s gems, and one with all my favorite music of the moment. And I am constantly updating these playlists and have a few I am dropping soon. So check it out by searching for Jake Zeman. Thanks again for watching, guys. Peace.